Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Alex Pilkington. I serve as the Florida State Coordinator for Students for Liberty. And I won't be the first person to point out that there's a bit of a political divide in this country. Having witnessed the political atmosphere grow increasingly hostile and divisive in the past couple of years, my friends and I have hoped for a way to promote the discussion of political differences in a calm and civilized manner. In proposing this event to the College Republicans, College Democrats, and Eagles for Liberty, I had hoped to address this issue. With their help, I considered it an honor to be able to say that we did it. Tonight, there are people from all over the political spectrum in one room engaging in a civil debate about our ideological differences. With elections around, we tend to isolate ourselves further into our partisan circles. But I hope at the end of tonight's debate, we can all leave here having learned something new about those we disagree with. I'd like to preface this debate by saying that this is not about candidates or campaigns. Tonight is not about political parties. Tonight isn't about Trump versus Hillary, nor Rick Scott versus Bill Nelson. Tonight is about ideas. What ideology can take us in the right direction? Is it the conservative ideology? Is it the progressive ideology? Or is it the libertarian ideology? After tonight, I hope we can say we're one step closer to answering that question. As an institute of higher education, Florida Gulf Coast University serves as a place where students come to not only learn, but to challenge their held beliefs and grow as critical thinkers. Universities should never be places of echo chambers or closed-mindedness. And we are very appreciative that our school can be a catalyst to returning to civil discussion and debate with those we fundamentally disagree with. Without taking up too much more time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening. Dr. Mohammed Al-Akim is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and Philosophy at Florida Gulf Coast University. He holds an honor Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts from McMaster University and completed his doctorate of philosophy at York University 
in Toronto, Canada. His primary research focuses on political, legal, and moral theory with special focuses on issues of minority rights and justice. Dr. Al-Hakim has taught philosophy, uh, Dr. Al-Hakim has taught courses in legal and political theory, ethics, history of philosophy, logic, and Islamic philosophy. He has also published on various topics including multiculturalism, identity politics, hate crime legislation, and government ethics. Dr. Alakim will go over format and technicalities as well as introduce the participants for this evening's debate. Good evening. Um, thank you, Alex, for those kind words and important uh, message in today's uh, political uh, framework we're in. Uh, good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us uh, this evening at Florida Gulf Coast University for a special public debate event. My name is Dr. Mohamed al Hakim, and I am an assistant professor at philosophy here at FGCU, and I will be the moderator for this evening's event. Among some of the guiding principles listed in our university's mission statement are the commitment to promoting diversity and helping foster informed and engaged citizens. Our mission statement is further grounded in the promotion of diversity and engaged citizenry in the overarching goal of advancing democratic ideals. If I may, I wish to take a few words here, just a few minutes, to say a few words about democratic ideals as a way of introducing tonight's special event. With the midterm elections just over two weeks away, the drumming up of citizens to get out and vote is stronger than ever. This is wonderful and captures an essential procedural element of democracy concerned with ensuring a fair process for resolving political disagreement and contest. The fairness of the process, however, would be somewhat empty without some deeper substantive values informing us of what fairness might entail. I hope it's not too contentious to suggest that it means more than simply resolving the conflict through a coin toss. Although a coin toss does align with our intuitive sense of fairness, it is far removed from what we mean by fairness in the context of democracy. Now I conjecture that this is because democracy is tied to a greater substantive moral values of equality, respect, and concern. That is to say, we value a certain type of democratic process, in this case voting, because we hold dear the ideas of moral equality the right of one's own conscience and expression, and we respect the freedom of each individual to pursue his or her own chosen conception of the good life. The pluralism and disagreement that results from respecting diversity and moral equality in civil discourse is not to be seen, as the political philosopher John Rawls reminds us, as a disaster, but rather as the natural outcome of the activities of human reason under enduring free institutions. That is to say, our reasonable disagreement is a featured hallmark of our democracy, and the management of diversity and differences are important to maintain in light of our moral disagreement and maintaining our moral integrity and commitment to equality, respect, and concern. Voting is, by, is, sorry, voting is certainly a valuable means for deciding but the spirit of democracy belongs as much to its moral underpinnings than it does to the procedural method we pick. So returning to these important values is essential to the maintenance and growth of democratic states, even if hypothetically speaking, voting systems were perfected to everyone's satisfaction. The importance of civil debate cannot be understated in today's political culture. We seem to have lots of debates these days, but we may be in need of better debates rather than just more. It is in the spirit of this substantive view of democracy that we are holding our special event today, and we bring together three distinguished speakers and debaters to engage on topics of shared interest and intense disagreement. We hope to model the value and the importance of preserving the underlying values of equality and respect through civil engagement on issues that matter to all of us. I would now like to take just a few moments to talk about the rules for, for the audience as well for our invited speakers. For the audience, we ask that you please refrain from interrupting the speakers and debate at all times. 
We ask that you refrain from clapping, cheering, booing, hissing, and any other general interruptions. The goal is to engage with the substance of the points made and to save discussion for after the event. I will ask you in a few minutes, though, to join me in welcoming our debaters, and I will ask you again at the end of the debate to join me in thanking them. We wish also to let the audience know that there are some students on the side here who will be typing away at computers as they are doing some live fact checking. We do our best to provide a forum that deals with the merits of the points. In the event that any major facts are misrepresented or misstated, I will highlight them <laughs> at the end of the event. Uh, finally, I ask if you would just take a moment to silence or turn off any cell phone devices or tablets or anything that will make noise during the event. As for our speakers, we have a certain format already established. Just to let you know what that format is, each speaker will be given seven minutes for opening remarks, upon which we have three prompt questions. For each prompt question, each speaker will have three minutes to respond. After all three speakers have gone, they will each get two minutes for rebuttals. After we've gone through our three prompts and our three speakers addressing them, we'll end with about a minute and a half each uh, for closing statements. For our speakers, we've picked a random selection for who goes first, and each speaker will have an opportunity for each prompt to go first, so they'll have a fair opportunity at it. I have cards here that will indicate when we have uh, one minute left, and I'll show it again with 30 seconds left, and then there'll be a card for stopping. Um, and if, of course, if necessary, we'll shut off the mics, but there's no need to. <laughs> um, and also, I ask that it be uh, one, speak, one speaker at a time to hold off uh, your points for rebuttals when it comes to your time. All right, well, tonight's invited debaters are from, all coming from Washington, D.C., but they have worked and uh, studied in various places across the United States and even Canada. Uh, so we are joined by David Azarar from the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Azarar is a director at the B. Kenneth uh, Simon Center for uh, Principles uh, Politics. Uh, he's also AWC Family Foundation Fellow. We also have um, Mr. Ryan Collins from the Center for American Progress. He's the Director of Government Affairs at the Center and works on policy issues relating to education, faith, health, poverty, and transportation. And last but not least, uh, we are also joined by Mr. Matthew Feeney from the Cato Institute. Mr. Feeney is Director on Projects on Emerging Technologies, working on the intersection of new technology and civil liberties. So, all right, well, um, with no further ado, we'd like to now start our live debate. Um, we'll go in the order of closest to me to the end there, uh, as, as designated before, I believe, right, with David uh, going first. So our first prompt for our, th uh, sorry, I don't have a first prompt. Um, we'll now begin with the seven minute open uh, forum with David. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for being here. And thank you to the College Democrats, the College Republicans, and Eagles for Liberty for uh, hosting us. Um, I'm a conservative. And uh, I got to say, I, I kind of got the short end of the stick on this one. Uh, not because libertarianism or liberalism are preferable to conservatism. They most emphatically are not. Uh, the reason I say I got the short end of the stick is that conservatism is not easy to define. Uh, and that so much of what passes for conservatism, especially in the swamp where I live in Washington, DC, is really just watered down liberalism. Many conservatives have come to define conservatism as whatever the left wants except a little bit cheaper, or whatever the left of 20 years ago wanted. In Washington, DC at least, there is much truth to Robert Louis Dabney's biting observation that American conservatism is merely the shadow that follows radicalism as it moves forward towards perdition. It's also the case that American conservatism is fractious. You got neocons, theocons, and paleocons, Kirkians, Burkeans, and Lockeans. You have traditionalists and constitutionalists, and now, of course, populists and nationalists, which may or may not belong on the right, depending on who you talk to. So which version am I here to defend? Well, as a conservative living in America, I take my bearings from the American family. I am, you could say, an American. As a conservative, I want to conserve the Republican regime of ordered liberty established by our founders. And let me immediately reassure my friends on the left and some members of the audience 
that when I say that I want to defend the founding, it doesn't mean that I'm defending America as it existed in the late 18th century. America at the time, and for a long time after that, not only fell short of its founding principles, but in the case of slavery, flat out betrayed us. As a conservative, I take my bearings from our founding documents, from the natural rights philosophy of the Declaration of Independence and the Republican framework of government found in the Constitution. And one thing that is readily apparent when you read these documents is that nowhere in the Declaration or in the Constitution are human beings classified according to race, sex, religion, ethnicity, you name it. For the founders, we were first and foremost free individuals who could stand on our own two feet. As Frederick Douglass once said, we believe that men are born with legs, not that they are in need of crutches. Our liberal friends have a tendency to view people on the one hand, not as being so much individuals as being part of various racial or sexual communities, and then also there's a tendency to view them as being a little bit weak, fragile, not capable of providing for themselves, victims, dare I say. Now, libertarians don't make that mistake, but here's the mistake that they do make. They forget that we're not just individuals, we're also Americans. The Declaration of Independence doesn't begin with an affirmation of individual rights. It begins by saying that we are one people that have assumed our separate and equal station amongst the powers of the earth. America is a sovereign country with borders. And we Americans are one people, different and diverse in many ways it is true, but also bound together by a common language, a shared past, united by a love of country, and a concern for the well-being of our fellow Americans. We are not an arbitrary assemblage of atomized individuals who so happen to live next to each other, each absorbed in our private pleasures. Nor are we a balkanized nation of hyphenated Americans wallowing in our oppression and competing against other ethnic and sexual groups for a slice of the pie. We are Americans, and as such, we are custodians. We are trustees. We are the inheritors of a way of life that we are bound to transmit to the next generation. For me, the mission statement for America, and therefore for conservatism, is found in the preamble of the Constitution. The sixth reason why we the people form this government. It is, and I quote, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Isn't that beautiful? This little clause gives you two profound insights into the nature of America. First of all, of course liberty matters, but what matters most are the blessings that come from liberty. So of course you can't have the blessings without the liberty, but it would be foolish to say that a liberty that yields no blessings is desirable. Liberty should not be confused with license. Only a fool would applaud the degeneration of his country and the corruption of his people on the grounds that, well, this is a free country and it's all unfolding under the auspices of liberty. And then second, we as Americans, we don't have a right to selfishly enjoy and squander these blessings of liberty. We have to pass them on to the next generation, which means that, first of all, there has to be a next generation and this has become a very serious problem, not just in the West, but across the developed world. There is only one developed nation in the whole world whose fertility rate is above replacement, and that is Israel. Across the developed world, we seem to have a pretty serious problem of losing the will to live. But it's not enough to have children. You gotta raise these children in such a way that they too are capable of transmitting these blessings to the next generation. That's why we conservatives are concerned about the health of the family, the state of education. That's why we talk about the importance of public virtue. In sum, I'm a conservative because I believe that for all of our differences, we are all bound together by ties of civic friendship. I'm a conservative because I believe not just in liberty, but in sustainable liberty. I'm a conservative because I know that there are no social issues. There are only posterity issues. 
I'm a conservative because I realize that when I need to think about politics, I have to consider how a particular policy affects us today, but also how it reverberates across time and whether or not it's sustainable. In closing, I'm a conservative because I am deeply grateful to live in this extraordinary country. Thank you. Thank you, David Azar. Please refrain, please refrain from clapping. Um, thank you. Um, this, I'm sorry, the gentleman is saying my mic is off. Could you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, you're coming through the other one. You're coming. I'll take a moment while they're fixing the mic to continue on now with Mr. Ryan Collins uh, with his opening statements. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks again for having us. I really do want to thank uh, the College Democrats, the College Republicans, and uh, Eagles for Liberty uh, for inviting us down here to have this, uh, I think, a very worthwhile discussion. So representing the progressive side here, I hear a lot of my friends ask me, what is, what is, what is progressivism? What is American progressivism? I constantly also hear, how does that overlap with Democrats? And what do Democrats stand for? I think that's a, a specifically pertinent issue right now as Democrats try to figure out exactly what they do stand for. And I think when asked that question, I have a lot of desires to respond with policy implications and policy answers, but I don't believe that's actually what the question is asking for. They're asking, what are our values? What do we stand for as progressives moving forward? I know my conservative friends think they know what they, that we are. We're either coastal elites, completely out of touch with Central America, or Middle America, <laughs> or we're hate-filled socialists who want to uh, jam health care down your throats through Medicare for All. We are neither of these things, I can tell you that much. I do believe we do have two core issues as progressives that I'd like to highlight. One, I think Americans, American progressives have always been based on the understanding that in our most basic form, we do better together than we do apart. That we are essentially a wolf pack. As such, we believe that anything that helps the whole be better than the sums of its parts is a good thing. There's a lot to unpack specifically within that statement, but economically speaking, that's why we do support the notion of free markets, because individuals are immensely creative. And when we do so, and we do so in a collaborative nature, we turn economic prosperity into even greater and greater things. Judicially, that means we need to eliminate barriers that not only hold back economic freedoms for Americans, but that also incarcerate the actual physical liberty of many individuals in this country. That's also why I call the, this is what I'd call the traditional American dream. That if you work hard and play fair, you too can bestow a better world for you and your, and your children. I also believe that those are aspects that the founders pushed for. Economic creativity, equal justice, and that's exactly what the American dream is. And that's what millions of Americans have striven for since. At the same time, I do also believe that American progressives recognize that this world, our country, our society, is not a static thing that it changes over the course of time, and that while our shared principles remain shared, that there are wide swaths of inequality and systematic roadblocks that have been both put up unintentionally and maliciously to prevent Americans from benefiting. That while the free market is a source of prosperity, that over time much of the wealth creation that this country has bestowed upon us has gone into the hands of too many, or too few, while the costs have been placed on the many and those who have no voice. That's why I'd argue the second principle for American progressivism is that of activism. The baseline that, in essence, nothing we do is for granted. That we may have many rights written into the Constitution, but there are many rights that are not. And it takes const constant, endless work to make this, this union the more perfect union that we all hope for. That means, I think, from progressive, a progressive angle, that this is through the active participation in, uh, active participation in our democratic and civil institutions. As such, we believe that government is not a means to an end, but a tool to leverage, to use and leverage against the inequalities and injustices that are produced because of our rank or civil life and economic system. That the Leviathan can function as a bulwark against our worst natures. This is where the idea of progressive was actually born. It was in the early 20th century under a Republican president, Theodore Roosevelt, who drove the progressive era by pushing back on major corporate trusts that had come to come to dominate the many aspects of Americans' lives. He's, he was inspired by the muckraking writings of the, the, the life and factories at the time. 
and the, the rise of the labor movement that produced the first minimum wage as well as first child labor laws. That's progressivism. That is quintessential progressivism. That our society is still very much an idea that needs to be actively worked on. That as a collective, we can try to fix it and that there is progress to be made. These are the progressive principles that drove FDR's New Deal, the Truman Doctrine, the Civil Rights Movement, and LBJ's Great Society. That reforming capitalism is not a bad thing and that equal justice is a necessity. This is more important now than ever as we are currently trying to adjust to new global circumstances, new technologies. And I do believe, and I do believe many progressives believe, that the, at the federal, state, and local level, government can sometimes be the only force to write on balanced scales. As I said, this is more true now today than it has ever been. In the last two years, we've seen tax cuts for the rich signed into law so that conservative mega donors can see a return on their investment for the campaign contributions. We've seen cons corporate consolidation in almost every single major U.S. industry, from tech to pharmaceuticals to the airlines. High and increasing prices for the basic stepping stones to a middle class are getting further and further away, resulting in crushing debt for college students, poverty wages for those without college degrees, health care costs exceedingly higher for seniors, and, and child care costs that are eating up half a family's income, a monthly income. Making matters worse, D.C. is conspicuously absent from this conversation. And in fact, it appears that we have a Congress and an administration that openly flaunts the rule of law because they think they'll get away with it. This is a distinct lack of justice and accountability in the system right now. Time and again, those with the levers of power continue to see the benefits as the majority are left to negotiate how to pay the bill. That's why I'd argue progressivism is as necessary now as it is ever. It does not mean we need to see a full sea change to socialism or violent revolution by some angry mob. That's because all we do really need to see is progressives showing up at the ballot box in two weeks and voting for candidates that are going to actively reform our economic system and franchise those who have, not had it, had, who have been without justice for too long and hold our current leaders accountable. That's what American progressivism is, and I look forward to discussing these merits further. Thank you. All right, and finally, I'd uh, like to ask Mr. Matthew Feeney from the Cato Institute to give his opening statements. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Mohammed, and thank you to you all for coming, and special thanks to the uh, College Republicans, the College Democrats, and Eagles for Liberty. It's really nice to be down somewhere where the sun is still shining. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to emphasize that I'm speaking for myself here, uh, not uh, the Cato Institute. I think Cato employs about 140 people, which means there are about 145 opinions about what libertarianism is. Uh, you're hearing from, from me. Uh, and I think, I'll, I'll begin by saying I think libertarianism is uh, often misunderstood. I think many people on the left will say it's a Randian seasetting cult, and you'll find some people on the right who will call, <coughs> who will say that it's uh, naive hedonism uh, disguised as a political ideology. Uh, and I'm not attributing those characteristics to Ryan or David, <laughs> but uh, I'm here to say that libertarianism, it's a political theory uh, that as such relates to government and political power. Uh, and it embraces a presumption of freedom and the minimization of coercion. So what does that mean? Uh, it, I'm not a big fan of the social economic divide that seems uh, prevalent throughout uh, a lot of political debates. You'll oftentimes hear someone say, I'm a fiscal conservative and I'm socially conservative as well. I have my issues with this. I don't see how gay marriage is not an economic issue, and I don't see how the minimum wage is not a social issue. But basically, uh, many libertarians would be comfortable with the description of social liberalism and fiscal conservatism, that the government should be very limited in our private lives and in our economy. So with libertarian governments uh, limited, and the roles of it are isolated to uh, protecting us from physical harm and fraud, uh, from people who break promises and hurt us. Uh, whether that's domestically with criminal justice or abroad with a foreign policy. And now that you've given, got some idea of what libertarianism is, I suppose I have to spend some time trying to convince you why libertarianism is superior to conservatism and progressivism. And I'm under no illusions that this will be a difficult task. Uh, I, <coughs> and the goal of, uh, my, my goal here is, um, I'm, I'm not arrogant enough to think I'll convince all of you by the end to be libertarians, but I hope that by the end you'll ha be better educated about what libertarianism, progressivism, and conservatism are. Uh, so I want to go through some facts about the world that at least helped me become a libertarian. Uh, I think you should be a libertarian because I think it's a political ideology that takes reality and individual rights very seriously and is best positioned to improve the lives of the most number of people. 
So I want to go through some, through some facts I don't think even us on the table would necessarily disagree with, but for me, they led me to libertarianism. One, individuals matter. Now that's actually a historically a relatively recent discovery, right? Uh, in, in, if you look back in history, societies where individuals don't matter, they really don't matter. Uh, I'm of the position individuals matter, as do their values and their rights. Secondly, values are subjective. Uh, some people like tea, they're the proper people. Uh, other people like coffee. Uh, there are some people who like skydiving. Uh, there are some people who, believe it or not, pay to go to Nickelback concerts, and there are those that couldn't be paid to go to Nickelback concerts. Uh, three, uh, the world is complex, but it's not chaotic. Uh, there are billions of us on the world, we're all doing different things with our subjective values. Uh, it's a very complicated world, but it's not chaotic. And in fact, some of the most valuable features of our economy are the product of human action and not human design. Orders uh, can occasionally be spontaneous, and we should embrace that. Uh, four, people are self-interested, not selfish. There are selfish people in the world. I don't want to uh, pretend otherwise, but most people are self-interested, which means when the baker goes to the bakery in the morning, he's not toddling off to the bakery looking forward to making you breakfast. He's pursuing his own self-interest. Uh, to me, selfishness is uh, pursuing your own interests at the expense of others, and fortunately, by and large, I think most people don't do that. Uh, five, we're very ignorant. Uh, we might know a little bit about policy, or you might know a lot about what you're pursuing your degree in, but I have no idea how to run an auto shop, or how to work a computer, or how many mines there should be in uh, the United States. I'm very, very ignorant about most of the world. Six, uh, non-government institutions really matter, whether they're religious institutions, sport organizations, charities like Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, the press, higher education, these are valuable. Uh, and finally, maybe the biggest one, politicians are people too. Uh, they are not special. Uh, I have lived in D.C. since January 2012, and it is Veep, not the West Wing. That is the most accurate portrayal of how that city works. And because uh, politicians are people, they are ignorant, self-interested, have subjective values, and I think that's worth uh, taking into consideration. So given all that, those facts actually lead me to uh, the conclusion that we should have a government that is not involved, at, very involved in... Uh, our personal lives uh, and in our economy. But it should protect freedom, markets, it should adhere to the rule of law, and it should minimize coercion. Remember that all rules and regulations have at the end the threat of violence and force. And I know this is a stereotypical flippant thing for a libertarian to say, but I think it is a crucial political problem that more people should take seriously. Uh, so to sum up, I will go through a few, few policies that I think um, are fair to say adhere to libertarianism. Uh, libertarianism is uh, pro-immigration, pro-market, pro-trade, pro-school choice, pro-free press, pro-freedom uh, of religion. It's pro-drug legalization, pro-legalization of prostitution. But it's anti-corporatism, it's anti-subsidy, anti-protectionism, anti-trade wars, and anti-military wars most of the time. Uh, that, I think, is uh, a fair summation of libertarianism. I feel like I do have some time to tease out the motions, but I won't if uh, I'm at the minute mark. Well, I'll come in uh, on time and under budget. <laughs> Thank you. All right, now we'll start the uh, prompt part uh, of the debate, which will have a prompt question, and we'll proceed with each speaker having three minutes to address the prompt, followed by two minutes each to rebut any points that were made by the other speakers. So again, we'll start with uh, the order of, for the first prompt with David, and moving on, and then we'll start with Ryan for the second one, and then Matthew right, for the okay. third one. Oh. All right, uh, so our first prompt. <clears throat> Beyond not harming others, are there any limits on what individuals should be permitted to do? <clears throat> All right, David. Uh, the short answer is no. Actions that are wholly self-contained, i.e. actions that do not reverberate across space and time to harm others, cannot be forbidden in a free society. This is America, and each and every one of us is absolutely free to do whatever the hell it is we want to do, so long, of course, as we do not harm others. Now, here's the rub. Everything hinges on how you define harming others. Our libertarian friends are going to define it in the narrowest possible terms, i.e. physically aggressing someone or directly causing them harm without their consent. Our liberal friends, on the other hand, have a tendency to define it in overbroad terms. 
For example, they think that so-called hate speech should be criminalized because it's offensive and it hurts people. As a conservative, I take the middle position. And I define harming others not according to a precise mathematical formula, but by looking at any particular individual ask action and asking myself a simple question. How likely is it that this behavior is going to spread across society and undermine the common good? If this is permitted, will more and more people do it, and may it reach a point where it begins to threaten what the Constitution calls domestic tranquility and our ability to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Let's take the easiest and most obvious example, drugs. Should you be permitted to smoke a doobie in your dorm room? Should you be permitted to go out into the woods, pop some shrooms, and commune with Mother Nature? It's a free country, our libertarians friends will say, and we're all adults capable of making our own decisions. But what happens, I ask, when more and more of our fellow Americans get addicted? What happens when you start to think through the effects of drug addiction on communities and the country as a whole? The broken homes, the parents who neglect and abandon their children, the rampant crime, the ruined lives, the devastation. Do individual actions have no ripple effect? Is each man a self-contained island? Are we not embedded as individuals into various communities? As a conservative, when I think of harm, I don't merely look at a snapshot of an individual action. Here's the meth, give me the money. What I do is I press play and I zoom out. And I ask myself, over time and across the country, is this sustainable? And if it isn't, and it most definitely isn't in the case of hard drugs, then I turn my attention to the very hard question of figuring out, well, what should we do about it? And I'll end in closing by saying that you can oppose the legalization of hard drugs as I do without, however, mindlessly defending every single current policy in the war on drugs. Thank you. Right. Right. So no surprise here. Uh, I would say yes, but it depends. Uh, I think David's absolutely right to start off with the question of how do we actually define harm, because that is really what this, the linchpin of this conversation is. I would say we don't necessarily, progressives don't necessarily over-define it in a very broad sense, but I think what I would like to kind of look at it is, is I see it as a cost to society. Harm can be physical, yes, but it can also be intellectual. Uh, it can be a very, uh, it can be a lot of different things, but I think ultimately the best word that, it ulti that, that enca encapsulates it is cost. This is a cost to our society. If that is the case, then I do say, I would agree that we do need to stop costs from rising. We have major problems with that across the board. We should stop that, but I also believe the other aspect is, and this is where I really do like to say that this is a yes, but with a caveat, is I do believe we have a responsibility as American citizens to make sure that we are paying stuff forward. Take example for taxes. I know the three, up, three of us up here have drastically different views on how we should tax people at what rates we should be taxing folks. I think it is a far less tenable position to argue that, uh, over the complete abolition of tax because we as Americans have a responsibility as a, as a society, as a community, to make sure that we are paying for the goods that we have. We take advantage of roads. We take advantage of education systems. We take advantage of mass aspects of communal resources. I think our climate change, we can certainly get into the climate change debate, but climate is one of these aspects that I think we have significant costs that we are not assuming so far. Because of this, I think we have a responsibility to pay forward, and I think the government in general can be a, a tool to make sure we're doing that. We also, I think, in that same sense, have a responsibility to make sure that we are protecting those that either are voiceless or cannot defend themselves. This is why, when you look throughout history, we've had significant instances of abuse and harm being used, and the system itself can be used to stop those things from happening. I know we'll have lots of conversations on specific aspects of regulations, but this is where regulations come into effect. They are there. We, we, we demand that we have police forces and firefighters and first responders to make sure that our communities are safe. Regulators, in some aspects, are doing the exact same thing 
whether it is in the SEC making sure that we're not seeing insider trading or that we are fighting tax fraud through the IRS, uh, among other things. So yes, we should, there are limits in what individuals should be able to do because one, they do inspire costs on others, and two, we have a responsibility of making sure that we're covering our own. Thank you. Right, thank you. <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, it depends. Uh, the, uh, the, the language here is very interesting. I would note that the, uh, the, the motion doesn't mention the word government at all. Uh, it says, beyond not harming others, are there any limits on what individuals should be permitted to do? So if by harm we mean physical violence and fraud, and by permitted we mean legally permitted, then there's, I suppose, not that much to, to, to debate. But I'm of the position that Activities that harm yourself and harm others are and must be legal. It's absolutely essential. You should not cheat on your spouse. You should keep your promises to your friends. You shouldn't feed your children too much junk food. And you shouldn't watch too much TV. You shouldn't smoke too much. You shouldn't drink too much. But I want all those activities to be legal. I don't view the government as a great moral arbiter, uh, and I don't believe that if people cheat on their spouse or eat too much junk food, that the state is the tool that we should reach to, we should reach to in order to solve problems. <clears throat> I'm not pretending that if we legalized all drugs that we wouldn't have problems. We would have problems. Some people would hurt themselves and others. That's absolutely true. Uh, but I think David made a very good argument for the uh, for the prohibition of alcohol, which is easily one of the most deadly drugs around that does ruin lives and does cause a little bit of, or some portion of crime. Uh, only look at drunk driving and assaults. Uh, smoking is harmful, but we allow it. And I think that we should keep in mind that the barrier for government entry into our lives should be very, very high. Uh, we have a lot of non-government institutions, uh, charities, churches, uh, things like that, that are turns out much better position to help people who have problems when they harm themselves or others. Uh, when we look at the Venn diagram of activities that are illegal and activities that are harmful, there's actually very little overlap. We might be able to agree on murder and assault and, and a few other things, but there are plenty of uh, harmful activities that are legal, and that, by the way, there are a lot of illegal activities that are relatively uh, harmless, although not without harm. Uh, I'll point out that when we have morals, we shouldn't look to, to the government. Uh, I'm sure any, there might be people in the room who view the Ten Commandments as a great moral guide, and I may count myself among them. But I'm very thankful that we live in a country where if we try to implement them into law, seven of the Ten Commandments are unconstitutional. We, we don't view the government as necessarily a moral arbiter, and I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Now we'll return to David. We have two minutes each for a rebuttal for any of the points raised. Um, well, you said that in America we shouldn't smoke too much. I think you haven't been here long enough and you still have your British yeah, ways. Uh, in America, <laughs> you're allowed to do a hell of a lot of things, but smoking is most emphatically not one of them. So Americans are <laughs> unbelievably intolerant of smoking, especially in the big cities. I don't okay. know how it is down here in Florida. Um, you, you raised the point of prohibition. I think it should have been addressed to Ryan. It's the progressives who banned alcohol, uh, not uh, the conservatives at the turn of the century. Although I will readily concede, if it got completely out of control and it threatened the continued existence of the United States of America, I wouldn't rule it out. I wouldn't want it imposed by judicial fiat. I wouldn't want a president to wake up one morning and say, OK, executive order. But why would we prima facie say it is fundamentally inconceivable to think of a set of circumstances under which rampant widespread alcoholism, with babies being born deformed because their mothers were drinking themselves into a stupor while they were pregnant, why couldn't this be elevated to a common political concern that may be legislated? I'd prefer we not get there. I am very much on the libertarian side of things in terms of being suspicious of government involvement, being well aware of the endless problems of regulatory capture, of special interest captures, you can have the best of intentions in the world. You come to Washington, D.C., they come out of the woodworks to embed into your laws their carve-outs and their demands. 
That said, I don't see why as a principle, which is what we're discussing here tonight, not particular policies. So to be clear, you don't go back saying there was a crazy guy with a funny accent from the Heritage Foundation who wants to ban booze. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I can perfectly imagine a set of conditions under which, yes, I would consider banning alcohol in America if it threatened the continued existence of the country. And I think you'd have to be crazy to say that in the name of liberty, you'd rather America disappear than ban a particular substance. Thank you. Right. So to, to respond to David's point, I think uh, you're picking winners and losers when you're talking about the drug versus alcohol. In essence, what you're saying is, is that we have a specific belief on the fact that some of these substances are going to be harmful for individuals. That is true, but we're going to make sure that we're making one illegal while others that may, may or may not be more harmful continue to go out there because there are social and there, there are social and economic interests in making sure that those stay there. By doing so, you're, you're invalidating the entire ideology that you guys stand behind. To, uh, to Matthew's point, I do believe that there is actually a, a, a government does have a means to create markets where there's no markets there. I think you can use governments to write the rules of the roads, particularly when you're looking at new technologies and all these things that are happening, and provide a framework in which the market can work. Because we know what happens when markets don't work is, is that the government has to come in and clean all of it up. And it costs a significant amount of, it, it costs far more at the end to clean it up than we could have written rules at the beginning of the road to make sure it goes forward. Okay. Is that it? <coughs> there you go. Okay. All right, uh, we'll proceed. Right, yeah, I want to state emphatically that I don't believe the legalization of heroin and meth is a threat to the existence of the United States. Uh, I don't, now, maybe one day you can imagine a drug that potentially it would, but I, that's not my position. Uh, I'm, I'm also of the, the, the opinion that a lot of the, the, the horrors that David highlighted are actually a direct result of prohibition. If you're worried about crime and uh, there is a lot of crime associated with drugs, but it's precisely because it's illegal. When was the last time Bud, Budweiser and Coors had a shootout over their brewery, right? In legal markets, you have courts. You have problems with each other. You go to court. You don't pull out guns. Uh, I'm happy to press pause and to zoom out, but I see a country that has spent more than a trillion dollars on the war on drugs that conducts dozens of SWAT raids every day and has the highest incarceration rate in the world. So uh, I'll press play with legalization assumed and think uh, the world won't be perfect, but it'll probably be better. Uh, we should... I want to conclude by pointing out that it's, it's not true to claim that our current war on drugs has anything to do with harm. Uh, the substances that are prohibited, the motivation was not anything to do with harm. And one of the best examples of this, I think, uh, is a quote from a former Nixon counsel, uh, some of you will know, uh, John Ehrlichman, who gave an interview uh, with Harper's where he said bluntly, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be against the war all black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. I'm not saying that David, of course, adheres to all of that, but uh, we should be aware that when we're talking about prohibited substances, harm is very rarely the reason that people are going for it. Uh, there's a whole book to be written on the history of drug prohibition and race, but uh, that will be for another time. Um, thank you. All right, now we are going to proceed to our second prompt, and we'll start with Ryan first, move on to Matthew, and then to David. All right, in that order, and you'll all be given three minutes each to address uh, the prompt. <clears throat> so here's the prompt. What conception of equality best fits the United States, for example, equal opportunity, equal resources, equal treatment, et cetera, and why? <clears throat> Starting with Mr. Ryan, three minutes. So I'll start with the pledge of the, what the Pledge of Allegiance says liberty and justice for all. I'd like to emphasize the all part. As I mentioned in my opening statement, America is an idea. And because it's an idea, it means that it's something we continually work towards. It's a, it, I'll make an important distinction right now. This is that America was never founded on providing equal rights to all citizens. But we as a society believe that it is an important value. And as such, we've worked towards making that and enshrining that in the way that we move forward. And yes, we've made progress. We have universal suffrage. Civil rights was, we moved a lot farther than we should, we're, we're not where we should be, but we've moved a lot further because of the civil rights movement. And worker rights across this last century have been just to name a few. But there is lots of work to be done. 
For example, we need to make drastic reforms to our criminal justice system with a particular focus on, prob on prosecution of drug-related and nonviolent offenses. I also think it's a huge problem that our good social outcomes are very dependent. Our good social outcomes, particularly when you look at education and employment, are drastically dependent upon one's socioeconomic status. It's amazing that as a country that is as wealthy as we are, that we have such stark disparity between groups. For example, African-American women are three to four times more likely to die due to, uh, uh, due to complications during pregnancy. When all the studies have been looked at, the only factor that can actually be taken into account is the color of their skin. Three to four more times more likely. That's insane. We are also sorting ourselves in this country in a way that is hearkening us back to the eras of segregation. Some states continue to pursue outrageous voter suppression laws that, whether intentional or not, disenfranchise large swaths of non-white populations. Our healthcare system is quickly becoming a bifurcated system that takes care of those who have funds and those who, who do not are stuck out in the cold. On that note, I also don't think it's crazy to argue that, a, that access to good, affordable health care is a human right. When, what this all sums up to is we, might, we, we must fight suppression at all levels of our society. It is all too prevalent throughout everything that we do that suppression finds its way in. That is why I said so, uh, earlier that to reach the American dream, we have to create systems that treat people similarly, and if we don't, we're not even at a point of, of considering a level playing field. Thank you. Matthew? Yeah, I'll begin by pointing out that there is a tension between liberty and equality of outcome, opportunity, and condition. Uh, if you are looking for a political ideology that will redistribute uh, resources uh, equally, you should not go shopping at the libertarian store. Uh, it's not to say, though, that libertarians don't have a conception of equality. Uh, the best conception of equality that is best, not just for the U.S., but the rest of the world, is, uh, is equality of equal treatment under law, that you should be treated the same in this country by the polity, regardless of your income, your race, your religion. Uh, sadly, I think Ryan would probably agree that uh, the law is not always applied equally in this country to every group, and that's something I think we agree on. I do want to point out, though, that it's inequality per se, especially when it comes to income inequality, is not uh, axiomatically a bad thing. Uh, a country that gets... Um, that throws off a dictator and opens up markets will probably uh, see an increase in inequality in the short term, and that's probably a sign of good things happening. If you look at the Gini Index, which measures countries' uh, inequality, uh, I spent today going to the CIA uh, World Factbook, which has some rankings on this that some people can quibble with. You'll see that the United States is about as uh, equal or unequal as Thailand and Peru. Uh, and then you look at a country like Norway, which is comparatively very egalitarian, and it's very similar to Iceland and, and Germany. But it's also very similar to Belarus and Moldova. Uh, the Belarus, of course, being uh, an authoritarian dictatorship. You can't look at a country's degree of inequality and come to many conclusions about whether it's a just society, whether it's a safe society, or politically stable. I suppose it's worth also mentioning that inequality will always be a feature of life just because of nature. Um, I will never be an NBA basketball player. Uh, I was very fortunate that I was, I was born to parents who were married and educated in a safe and, and wealthy country. Uh, it's unclear to me what kind of policies could be put in place to get rid of luck and happenstance. There will always be some degrees of inequality. I will finish by recommending a book written by my former colleague, uh, Brink Lindsay, who examined inequality and came to an interesting conclusion, uh, namely that a lot of uh, the inequality we see when it comes to income can be attributed to uh, the failings of a lot of our education systems that are not preparing us for 21st century economies. Uh, there really is a stratification when it comes to American class that should worry all of us. But I'll finish on that now. Thank you. And finally, David. So what conception of equality best fits the United States of America? Uh, the short answer, I think, is equal rights under the law with some degree of equality of opportunity. Allow me to explain. Equal rights, that's the easy part, right? The Declaration of Independence says all men, which means all human beings, regardless of race, sex, religion, you name it. Each and every one is, of us is created equal, and we're all endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights lists other rights. All Americans 
possess the same rights. So no gay rights, no women's rights, no black rights. There are core natural rights and civic rights, and everyone has them. And if they're being denied to you, it's a concern regardless of your skin color, your sexual orientation, your you name it. Now, we also want equality in the enforcement of the law. It's right there in the 14th Amendment. You want the laws to be colorblind. Now, the laws will make certain reasonable distinctions, uh, for example, between minors and adults, which I know sucks for those of you who want to buy booze here on, on campus, but uh, that's the way it is. But the law is not allowed to arbitrarily or unjustly discriminate against or in favor of any group of citizens, either by giving some special privileges to some or by refusing to enforce laws against others. The goal, as James Madison very, very nicely put it, is equal laws protecting equal rights. I think we'll all agree on this one. Where things get complicated is when you turn to equality of opportunity. Without a doubt, the most cherished term in America's political lexicon, but also the most elastic one. You see, the problem when you talk about equality of opportunity is that it blends together two distinct ideas. On the one hand, the availability of opportunities, and then on the other, the capacity of people to seize these opportunities. So I'm a conservative, and I support reasonable anti-discrimination laws in the private sector that promise all Americans an equal opportunity to apply for any particular job or desirable position. I am, however, very, very suspicious of the argument made by our liberal friends that the only way you know you've eliminated discrimination is if all groups are proportionally represented in all realms of life. You see, for liberals, there's a tendency to say that equality of results for groups is the measure of equality of opportunity. I firmly reject the idea that America should be engineered so that we find, I don't know, 5.6% Asians in all realms. Such quotas are incompatible with the free society. Now, as a conservative, however, I am very sympathetic to the argument made by our liberal friends that life isn't fair and that we're all born into vastly different circumstances that decisively shape our ability to compete for available opportunities. You guys know the story about the guy who was born on third base but thinks that he hit a triple? Well, I'm also concerned about the kid who was born with no shoes and no baseball bat. I think liberals go too far in trying to equalize life chances, but I still favor, as a conservative, measures to provide a threshold of opportunity for all American children, regardless of the circumstances under which they're born. Thank you. Now we'll allow two minutes for rebuttal, starting with Ryan. So I think, I think we can all up here agree that the rule of law is probably the main driving component to make sure that there is equality for all in the United States. I think we all agree with that. I think we do probably differ in how that is actually practically done in the United States. And what as, as a progressive, what I would say is that, to Matthew's point, yeah, there is inequality. There's always going to be inequality in, in the world moving forward. But particularly in this country, there are systematic roadblocks that have been put up because of historical and cultural uh, norms over the course of our country that have pushed specific groups to be disenfranchised, both from the economic system, from the voting system, from society in general. And our goal is to make sure that that, one, doesn't happen anymore, two, that we can reverse it in some form or another, and three, that we can move forward as a society uh, in a way that everybody has at least some form of chance at the American dream. I think that's really where we're going for. I do not actually believe that like, we need to have quotas of specific populations across the board. I don't think any progressive would actually say that. I think what we really want to get at is, is that there are groups that have been disenfranchised that we need to talk for and we need to speak up for because they can't. And there are, there are rules that have been written into our system that can be removed if, to, to help them forward. Thank you. Matthew? Yeah, I feel a little bit like a Swiss negotiator here. I'm trying to. Uh, so the first thing, so so to Ryan's points first, I'll say, you know, I, I think you raise interesting points that, that uh, are worth taking seriously. I will, maybe it's my philosophy background, quibble with, you know, healthcare right. I think not everything that's good and valuable is necessarily a right, right? Uh, but that's a discussion for the philosophy professor in his class later. Uh, I. 
I'm curious about, Ryan, the, what, what's the end state and how will you be able to identify it? If it's not with a certain quota being fulfilled, if it's not with a certain degree of income, when does the Center for American Progress and Ryan say, all right, mission accomplished? Uh, that's, that would be interesting to, to unpack a little. Uh, David said a lot that I, I agree with. I would just say uh, that I think I need to do a, probably a better job at this, but uh, the Constitution, of course, wasn't written in a vacuum, and we don't operate in a society in a vacuum, and we should be cognizant of the, the history that post the 14th Amendment, there continued to be, of course, not any news to you, of course, the uh, widespread uh, discrimination and pr persecution of many people in this country. And uh, that's more a point, I suppose, about persuasiveness than fact, but it's something that I certainly try and take more seriously going forward. You have an on minute if you want to. Another minute? Uh, oh, okay. It, it um, is, just in case. So I think I've made excellent points so far, <laughs> and I, uh, <laughs> no, I'm sure you're all uh, very persuaded. Um, I, I was born at a very young age, and um, no, I'm, I'm happy to, to take no, you're absolutely, you're, you're, You yeah. are at liberty to not use your time mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and finally, uh, David. Um, well, Ryan, I was very pleased to hear you say that you don't believe in quotas, uh, and I don't call into question your sincerity, and maybe many liberals feel that way. What I have seen is a very regrettable tendency in America to view any disparities in outcomes for the groups we keep track of, African Americans, Hispanics, women, LGBTQ, we don't pay attention to Mormons for some reason, we don't pay attention to Catholics. I'm Jewish, thank God we don't pay attention to Jews because they are vastly overrepresented in a whole bunch of places. But we've selected a certain number of groups and we have decided that if they are overrepresented in the bad realms of life or underrepresented in the desirable realms of life, not just we're gonna look into it, there is almost the presumption that it's racism, sexism, homophobia, structural inequalities. Now, I'm not an idiot. I know this country's past. I know the grotesque way that blacks, for example, have been treated. Of course, we should be more attentive to disparities there. But we cannot lose the presumption of innocence. And I feel that we're drifting in that direction today in America where any disparity the onus is now on the person to defend themselves and say, you're not discriminating. And the courts have embraced this insane logic of disparate impact. It's a court uh, case called uh, Griggs v. Duke Power. Again, the motivation is not a bad one. But the end result is, if you have in place a business practice that is having a disparate impact on certain groups, the onus is then on you to prove that this meets an absolute business necessity and that there's no other way to go about meeting it. Basically, a presumption of guilt. I'm not comfortable with that. Thank you. Now we head to our last prompt for the evening for our three speakers. This time we'll start with Matthew first, and then David, and then Ryan. So we're going to move a little bit away from the individual freedom and equality context and move into the international context. And our third prompt question is, uh, what should the aim of America's foreign policy be? Starting with uh, Matthew, we have three minutes each. Right. Uh, the aims of American foreign policy should be to protect America's vital interests. Uh, I think this is an area, actually, where the conservatives and progressives have unfortunately been aligned the most, if you take a look at recent history. Uh, I remember uh, waking up on Election Day in 2008 and being hopeful that the Obama administration would usher in a reversal of the war on terror that, of course, uh, started shortly after the attacks of 9-11. Uh, speaking of 9-11, I'll mention that I'm um, rather frightened that there'll soon be soldiers fighting in that war who were not alive on 9-11. Uh, and I think that that, at the very least, should prompt us to dramatically rethink American foreign policy. Uh, as many of you know, of course, the Obama administration was hardly the hope and change candidate that he promised to be when it came to foreign policy. Uh, I will uh, direct the fact checkers to the Council on Foreign Relations <laughs> article that I'm about to quote. Uh, in in 2016, uh, the U.S. bombed Iraq, Syria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, dropping more than 26,000 bombs, which is a rate of three bombs every hour for 24 hours a day in that year. That is, also, is amazing when you especially consider uh, the Constitution outlines a process by which you're supposed to declare war on uh, countries, which has been conveniently ignored by many people uh, and many administrations from the left and the right. Also point out that this uh, arrangement we have with uh, military adventurism 
uh, has put us into weird alliances or abusive relationships with states like Saudi Arabia while we spend our time talking about how bad Russia, Iran, and North Korea are, opening us up to accurate accusations, I think, of foreign policy hypocrisy. I'm going to finish by outlining what I think are the five conditions for American military intervention. Uh, these are put forward by my uh, colleague, Chris Preble, and I think they're excellent. So, one we sh so before that, I should mention, uh, don't call libertarians isolationists. Uh, North Korea is isolationist. Uh, Switzerland is non-interventionist. There's a big difference between what I'm advocating and isolationism. But here are the five conditions. One, there has to be a vital US national interest at stake. Two, there has to be a clear national consensus in support of the mission. Three, we should understand the cost beforehand and have a plan for how to pay for them. Four, we should have clear military objectives. We should know what the victory conditions are, going beyond, of course, declaring war on an idea. Uh, five, we should make sure that we use force as a last resort, that we have exhausted diplomatic means and our State Department uh, resources. Uh, aside from being uh, dangerous to the men and women in uniform, I think that uh, American foreign policy has been very dangerous to our budget. Uh, U.S. military spending in 2017, something like $610 billion, which is more than China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, India, France, the U.K., and Japan combined. Uh, almost, half of, uh, defense, uh, almost half of discretionary spending in 2017 was defense. Uh, if it's not bad for our international reputation, it's certainly bad for our budget. Thank you. David? Uh, this is one of the most contentious and difficult questions in American political history. To this day, there's no consensus on it. There's no consensus on the left, and there's no consensus on the right. Uh, I find the clearest and most concise answer to that question can be found in George Washington's 1796 farewell address. So this is the message he gave to Americans as he left office to retire to Mount Vernon. And there he lays down what I think are the two great rules that should guide our thinking about foreign policy. First of all, and I quote, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible, end quote. We're a commercial republic. We're not an empire. It is not in our nature to invite invade, pardon me, and colonize others, although regrettably, we have occasionally done so. Our preferred method of interacting with others is to trade with them. And yes, we trade with the whole world, but we very, very jealously guard our national sovereignty and our independence. We firmly believe that the nation state is the basic unit of geopolitics. We work with other nations to address a whole bunch of issues. We don't reject multilateralism. We even sign treaties with countries. But we firmly reject the contemporary drift towards transnationalism and the Kantian calls for world government. The second thing that Washington says is, we should choose peace or war as our interest guided by justice shall counsel. That's a really crisp and clear formulation. Foreign policy is about our interests, not the interests of others, not the well-being of humanity. America, like other countries, does not exist to protect the rights of mankind, only those of its own citizens. But then comes in the clause, guided by justice. We do not embrace an amoral realpolitik. We don't believe that the end justifies all the means. We pursue our interests, but we are very mindful of the demands of justice, which hems in our pursuit of interest. And let me, so these are, I think, the two great rules. I'll end by touching upon a school of conservatism that really doesn't belong on the right when it comes to foreign policy and has uh, caused a lot of harm to the reputation of conservatism, namely neoconservatism. How it is that this utopian worldview that wants to build democracies the world over and that culminates in President Bush's call in his second inaugural address to end tyranny the world over, how such an insane utopian promise 
utterly unmoored from reality came to be associated with conservatism, well, that just illustrates my point that in Washington, D.C., a hell of a lot of things that go by the name of conservatism are not conservative. Conservatives are not indifferent to the fate of liberty across the world. We support democracies. That said, we are very, very careful in risking our lives and our treasure to go die on behalf of other people's liberties. And uh, Matthew, I should say, I generally agree with the five points you laid down. I suspect we may quibble about the application in general cases, but I thought they were generally sound. We'll save the quibbling for the uh, <laughs> rebuttal. And finally, Brian. Uh, this is a pretty broad topic. Uh, <laughs> uh, first off, I think at its base, uh, Americans, America's foreign policy needs to place the idea of democracy at its very center. Uh, this can come in two forms, I think, primarily. One, we need to be an example here at home of what a functioning democracy should look like. And two, we should strengthen our, our, uh, our alliances with democratic countries across the world. That is no small feat today, given the strategic global challenges that we face, and particularly with the rise of authoritarian regimes and uh, illiberal populists across the world. I would say that a foreign policy dedicated to advancing democracy alongside a sustained effort to strengthen our de democratic system here at home is worth pursuing for three key reasons. One, it will advance US security and economic prosperity. I can't remember the exact statistic, but it is, uh, in essence, a country that has a McDonald's in it does not fight another country that has a McDonald's in it. Uh, democracies do not go to war with each other. Uh, they tend to be far more stable. They tend to generate long-term uh, prosperity, and that benefits both the United States and the world at large. Additionally, my second point, it counters authoritarianism, which is kind of the antithetical aspect of democracy. It's no surprise that China and Russia are working to undermine the, the global order that America set up post-World War II because they're trying to, fit, to carve out spheres of influence that they can control. I can also, I assume it's also probably not a controversial thing to say, is that if they are successful in doing that, that makes for a far more dangerous world that we live in. Supporting democracy pushes back on that effort. It also happens to be the right thing to do. I think Churchill put it best, no one pretends that democracy is a perfect or all, or, or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other forms we've tried from time to time. <laughs> Liberal democracy deserves America's support, not only for the governments that it enables, but also because it is the best form of government to allow people the options of what they can, of, of what they can say and have a general sense of where their country is headed. It also happens to support basic aspects of human rights, which I think everybody in this room would support. I really do want to make a point on like, we need to change the norms that are coming out of this country because the, the example we are currently setting for the world is not a very good one. We have a president who daily undermines the rule of law, attacks journalists, attacks the judiciary, attacks law enforcement, and has adopted openly xenophobic policies in trying to ban specific populations from entering this country. Those are not values I assume lots of folks stand up for. I do not believe that's what this country was founded upon. And the best thing we can do to change our foreign policy right now is change the example we are setting towards uh, setting towards the world. Thank you, and now we'll start with the rebuttals, starting with Matthew. Rebuttal. Rebuttal. Yeah, uh, I didn't think I was, we were gonna fit immigration in, but David's <laughs> given me an opening that I can't resist. So uh, I think, uh, when we think of foreign policy, I think we should think about trade, and we should also think uh, of immigration as part of that. And uh, I was very happy years ago to take an oath on the US Constitution to become a naturalized American. Uh, I've read it a few times, and. I struggle to find uh, in Article 1 an enumerated power that allows Congress to limit the migration of people to the United States. Uh, Ilya Soman at George Mason has also made this point. Uh, the first 99 years of this country's history, uh, there were no federal restrictions on immigration and it was still a sovereign country with borders. Uh, so I just throw that out there to be uh, controversial. Uh, I'm very, I, you know, I'm glad that David disassociated himself from the neocons so I don't have to do that. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> 
Uh, for Ryan of foreign policy, yeah, I think you, you raise a lot of uh, good points, so some of which I agree with. Uh, I didn't get a chance to ask what you think about uh, our partnership with que questionable regimes. If you want to be an outward-looking country, it seems like there should be moral lines to draw occasionally. And uh, also, what, what do you think perhaps Obama could have done differently? Because he seemed to lead a, leave a loaded weapon in the Oval Office for the next guy to come into. Uh, Obama was not shy about flexing uh, American military muscle abroad, and uh, I wonder if, in retrospect, you think he could have done something differently. Thank you. Yeah. David, two minutes. Um, so whereas I did very much agree with your five principles, inevitably when we get to immigration, the craziness <laughs> comes out with the libertarians. Uh, so we're supposed to believe, uh, I mean, hear me out on this one, that the American founders thought that, yeah, there would be no power to decide who comes into the country because they were libertarians who believed in open borders. Yeah, that's what the founders thought. And it's not in the Constitution. Well, I'm very sorry to tell you, and maybe you didn't read this part when you did your oath to become a citizen, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 10. Yeah. Congress has the power to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas mm -hmm. and offenses against the laws of nations. And one of the clear offenses of the law of nations is to trespass and come into a country where you're not allowed to be. You could also read a power to regulate immigration in the power of naturalization and argue that it was embedded in there. Either way, it is folly to suggest that America was founded on open, on open borders and that the national government has no power to police its borders. I think it's your turn. No, I'm happy. I'm this will uh, drinks afterwards. So, <laughs> yeah, right. so, Matthew, I think we, we do actually probably align more often than not on this, on this issue. I think we do need to protect vital interests uh, on a, in our foreign policy as we, as we move forward. Um, I definitely do think we need to re-look at the budget effects of what the military spending in this country are. Uh, last year, we spent $1.2 trillion in terms of discretionary spending, six point, six, 666 billion of that spent on defense. Uh, there is very little oversight of what we're actually spending on, and if you look at some of the programs and projects that are coming out of the Defense Department, uh, the F-35 is a perfect example of something that is probably not going to be very useful for uh, our, our country going forward. We print tanks because it's politically, uh, it's politically good for Rob Portman in Ohio, uh, even though the, the military has said we do not need any more tanks. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm happy to talk budget and all that stuff because I think that is something we definitely need to look into. Uh, to your point on, uh, on Obama, I do think uh, there's certainly aspects of his foreign policy that I, I, I disagree with, I think progressives would disagree with. I think you make very good points on the fact that we're going to have kids fighting in Afghanistan who've never, who were born after 9-11. Uh, we've never really had a good, clear uh, objective in that country uh, moving forward, and I think that's a lapse on Obama's part as well. I think it's a lapse on Trump's part as well. Um, that said, I think what Obama did well was recognize that uh, one of the greatest, th two things, the two greatest assets we have in our foreign policy space is one, our, our national reputation. Uh, we tend to try to, uh, we have promises and we try to keep them. Um, that has been less so under this administration. Um, and then we have also, we have not, at least in the last two years, taken advantage of the wide swath of allies that we have across, across, the, across the globe. I think we have 60 specific military partnerships with countries around the world. We have hundreds of more informal and formal on the economic ties. Uh, and we drastically do not take advantage of those because that is a world, like we set up that system post-World War II to benefit the United States. And it has benefited the United States immensely even mo for, most, for the most part. Um, there was one thing I wanted to hit on this. I can't remember. Oh, hold on there. I was right. No. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. This brings us to the end of the uh, three prompts and the uh, main part of the debate. Now I welcome each one of you, starting with uh, David, to give uh, two minutes for closing remarks to tie up anything that you want to address or to address any last leftover points. It's, it's not seven minutes? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's... I was told two minutes, I don't know. right? Was it? Seven? Uh, sorry? I don't know. It's, it's seven, sorry. It is, it is, I was, okay, I was misinformed. It's seven minutes each yeah. for oh, right. um, If you can do it in a minute and a half, I will be impressed, okay. though. <laughs> no, just kidding. I'll, seven minutes each. Okay. I apologize. Well, I began this evening by telling you why I'm a conservative. 
I'm a conservative because I want to secure the blessings of liberty for my fellow Americans and for our posterity. I love this country, and I feel bound to ensure that future generations are also receiving the blessings of living in a free, prosperous, and united America. Now, my fellow panelists, I don't think would disagree with the sentiment, although they sure as hell wouldn't use this language to describe their ultimate aims. The real problem with them, though, is that while they might agree in principle with the sentiment, in practice, they support policies that in the long run, in the long run pardon me, will harm posterity and eventually will threaten the very existence of our country. It's not because they're malicious in intent. Quite the contrary. They're quite, both of them are quite likable fellows. And I've spent enough time talking to liberals and libertarians to know that they generally mean well and that they sincerely believe that America and the whole world, for that matter, would be better off if their ideas triumphed. I also must confess that I'm a bit sympathetic to where they're coming from since I am well aware of the seductive lure of their ideas. I used to be a liberal in college. Who isn't? And I have flirted with liberal libertarian ideas as a conservative. The appeal of each ideology is undeniable. Libertarianism, in effect, tells you that all you need to understand the whole of political reality, both at home and abroad, is the non-aggression principle, whose practical teaching is pretty simple. Consenting adults can do whatever they want, and other people's problems are never your problems unless you choose to make them so. That's it. And there, from the comfort of your dorm room, you can solve all of the thorniest problems confronting mankind. It's always the same answer. More liberty, less government. And if you ask, well, how the hell is this going to work? You're told, don't worry about it. Spontaneous order. Never mind that Hayek net so, uh, never said such a thing. Nope. It's spontaneous because you know liberty. Ultimately, if we had enough liberty, they would tell us, you could eliminate war, and the whole of humanity would get along. We could get rid of countries and just be our individual selves. Well, you may say, well, this sure sounds good. Who wouldn't want that? All the world living in peace and plenty, individual choice galore in all realms. Sign me up. Just tell me what to do. And this is where it gets really good. The libertarian answer is nothing. You do you. Just focus on your own self-interest. It'll all magically follow. Libertarianism, I know you said it didn't, but it really does make selfishness a virtue. It denies that we have any binding positive duties to help others. It says you're allowed to help others if you want to, but no one can force you to help your fellow citizens. Everyone is just left alone to focus on doing their own thing. And if we all do that, this is the best part, everything's just going to work out in the long run. This is libertarianism in a nutshell. Simplicity and selfishness all wrapped into one. What's not to like? Now, liberals will object. Now, they're not going to reject the utopian side. They will also promise a war in which war and famine and disease have been forever conquered, and in which the whole of humanity lives in harmony. In fact, they're actually going to one-up the libertarians and say, we're going to create a world in which every child, regardless of the circumstances in which she's born, will receive all that she needs to realize her full potential, and will have the same chance to succeed as anyone else. Let me quote President Barack Obama, who said in his second inaugural address, we are true to our creed when a little girl born into the bleakest poverty knows that she has the same chance to succeed as anybody else. Not a good chance, the same chance. How could you resist that? What sort of a heartless monster are you? Now, it is true our liberal friends will admit, it's going to cost a lot of money to create that world. And to their credit, they're willing to pay for it. They think it's their duty. And yes, it'll cost a lot of money, but it's also made up for in that special feeling you get from being a liberal, a feeling good about yourself. Because you care, and you're kind of smarter than everyone else. <laughs> Human nature being what it is, such flattery coupled with utopian promises is very hard to resist. 
but it must be resisted. However much liberal and libertarian ideas may sound appealing, and I realize how appealing they sound, they suffer from just one little, little, little flaw. They're completely utopian. They're based on an unduly rosy view of human nature and are therefore completely impracticable. Certain moderate strands of liberalism and libertarianism, of course, are going to espouse certain sound policies. But neither one is fit to govern the country. Neither one finds any support in the tradition of political philosophy or of great statesmanship. Can you imagine for one second how Aristotle, Machiavelli, or Locke, to say nothing of Washington, Lincoln, or Churchill, would react if you told them that the purpose of America is to maximize individual liberty in all realms, that we should legalize the most addictive substances known to man, that we should just open up our borders for whoever wants to come here, that we can create a world in which we all get along and sing Kumbaya together. They would laugh right at you. I would like to end on an ecumenical note. I believe that there are many issues on which conservatives can collaborate with libertarians and liberals. I can only think of one where the three of us probably would get along, and that's probably over-criminalization and criminal justice reform. But then again, we can find areas in which we work together. Bipartisanship, bipartisanship pardon me, in Washington, D.C. has seen much better days, but there is no reason why well-intentioned, open-minded people who disagree politically can't have productive conversations. And I would like to end, as I began, by thanking again the university and the three groups that are hosting us for doing this. And this is something that is missing very much on our college campuses and in Washington, D.C., where I live. Thank you. Thanks, Great. Brian. Well, hopefully I'll be short. Uh, I know we have seven minutes, but hopefully we'll make it. Uh, again, I want to uh, reiterate the thanks to the, the College Democrats, the College Republicans, and uh, Equals for Liberty uh, for putting this on. I think this has been a, 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 I've had a lot of fun. I hope everyone out there has been having fun, and I hope that you find the conversation at least a little bit stimulating. Um, as a progressive, I think uh, I have a lot to be concerned about with the current direction of this country. Uh, I think that a lot of the values and the norms that I grew up with, uh, that I espouse, are under constant attack now. Uh, and I do believe that uh, we, need to, we need to do something about that. Um, I'm glad to hear, David, you like our ideas, um, th that, they are, that they're intriguing and that they're, uh, they, they tempt you to want to come over to our side. Um, it, it's good to know, because I think they are good, too. Uh, I, do, I do agree that you know, we may be a little utopian, but I think that's kind of the point. Uh, these are ideas, and as I kind of mentioned in my opening statement, uh, this country is never going to be perfect but we hope to strive to make it a more perfect union. Uh, and that requires constant effort and work. And that's why I always go back to those two founding principles that I believe under, uh, kind of underline progressivism. One, we're a wolf pack. We are better together than we are separate. And two, if you actually take that collaboration and put it into activism, you can accomplish a lot. With that in mind, we have huge challenges facing this country right now. We have massive consolidation in, in our corporate interests. Workers have less and less say when they're talking about their bargaining rights as well as their, as well as their take home pay. Uh, the cost of prescription drugs is out of this world, as it, which is a symptom of, that, of some of those, of those instances. As I mentioned in kind of one of the earlier prompts as well, is that there are, to make matters worse, there have been historical and cultural decisions over the course of time that have alienated and disenfranchised significant portions of the population to be underrepresented in aspects of this country. And as a progressive, I think we can change that. This also goes to the larger aspect of what we do in the world. I think when we come back to the aspect of what values we care about, we care about democracy. Um, I'm, oh, this was what I actually meant to say. Is our conversations with Saudi Arabia post the killing of the journalist, is it, there needs to be consequences to those types of things. We do not necessarily have the, very, like, the vital interests we had before with that country that we do now, and I think we can, we can probably distance ourselves a little bit more. And that goes back to the point, like we stand on principles and we stand on values, and this is the type of reputation that we project to the rest of the world. That's the type of stuff that I think progressives really care about and want to move forward on. And with that, we'll close. Thank you. Matthew? 
Yeah, I don't know if I'll take all uh, seven minutes, but I do want to thank you all for coming out. I know all of you had probably other things to do on a Monday evening, and I, thank you. Uh, I'm not claiming that a libertarian world will be perfect. I'm just claiming it will be better. Uh, I'm not a utopian, uh, I promise. <laughs> um, I think that uh, if you implemented every libertarian reform, there are certainly some people who will get hurt. I'm not going to uh, try to convince you otherwise, that that, but ultimately I think the world would be a better place. Uh, I think I do take human nature quite seriously. I think if you give a group of people unlimited money and almost unlimited power, and then you give them guns, bad things are gonna happen. Uh, and I think that that kind of uh, power should be constrained. Uh, I think ultimately libertarianism is actually an optimistic vision. I think uh, maybe this is my, uh, this is a flaw of mine, but I am an inner optimist. I think that uh, despite some of my friends that actually human beings left alone aren't perfect people, but they tend to make uh, good choices and they are charitable in the best of times. Uh, and libertarianism is also the ideology that takes individual rights seriously. I was really happy to work at an organization that argued in favor of the Supreme Court decision that legalized gay marriage, and we filed a brief in that case, but we also filed a brief in defense of the Christian baker who did not want to bake a cake for a gay wedding. I don't know how many other organizations have defended the right to uh, be married in a gay, to be, uh, to be in a gay uh, marriage union and also defend the right of uh, Christian bakers. And ultimately, I think libertarianism, if taken seriously, does allow for the enrichment of more people. And uh, I know that that's ultimately a data point, but I think the data will bear me out if you look at countries that have embraced liberalization of their economies and have allowed citizens more freedom. Uh, the results, I think, do speak for themselves. Uh, I want to finish with maybe a conciliatory no note that I, I note a, a lot of agreement among the three of us, actually. Uh, in these tumultuous political times, I think it's nice to sit at people who, where uh, we basically think trade's a good thing, all of us, I think, and that's, that's good. Uh, we believe uh, that American institutions matter. Uh, and more importantly, perhaps, I think we all agree that ideas matter. Uh, and I think uh, the fact that you're in this room makes me suspect that you think the same thing. Uh, and maybe I can get a little uh, teary-eyed about my newfound Americanism, but uh, that a Moroccan-Canadian Jew and an Anglo-American <laughs> Kiwi can sit down with <laughs> Ryan from Colorado and... Uh, <laughs> and talk about uh, the best course of uh, this, this country is, uh, makes me happy, uh, and I hope it does uh, you too. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like you to join me in thanking our speakers uh, tonight uh, for coming here and, and sharing with us. I wanted to say that tonight was special uh, because we were observing a, a civilized debate, and in some sense it's kind of sad that it's special because it shouldn't be special, it should be the norm of our political discourse. But this has become the special venue precisely because we're able to carry out conversation between three individuals who are friends but disagree on, on issues that matter to all of us. So I hope we've been able to at least model, model something that's important to American discourse and democratic discourse in general, and that is the ability to sit down and talk about our differences in a way that's conducive and not just merely trying to win points. Uh, politics has somehow become a moved away from a zero, has become a zero-sum game where individuals just want to win uh, and have victory uh, given to them. But when that happens, I think we all start to lose in some important sense. So thank you so much for modeling something that we, we, we need uh, uh, today. And I'd like to uh, ask the audience now to join me in thanking our speakers uh, for the wonderful event. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This brings, this brings us to a conclusion to this evening's event. Thank you so much.